Welcome, dear friends, to this latest episode of the podcast series, The Way Out is In. I am Joe Confino, working at the intersection of personal transformation and systems change. And I am Brother Fap Hu, a Zen Buddhist monk in the tradition of Zen Master Tikihan in the Plum Village community in France. And today, Brother, we're going to be talking about three key ingredients to being active in the world and engaged, which is what Thich Han was all about. And those are the meditator, the artist, and the warrior. The way out is in. Hello, dear listeners. I am Joe Confino. And I am Brother Fab Hu. So today is your topic. So you said to me yesterday, Joe, I want us to talk about the meditator, the artist and the warrior. And I thought, oh, this is the first time I don't have a clue what we're going to be talking about. So Brother Fapu, help us out. Why are we picked this topic today? I have been giving a few workshops with one of my sisters, um, talking about one of Tai's latest book. Zen and the Art of Saving the Planet. And we we were asked to speak about one of the chapters that that relates to us. And for me, when I read um, this chapter about the warrior, the meditator, and the artist, it resonated in me because these are three elements that I see is in every person. And in the tradition of Plum Village, we are asked to meditate, but not to just meditate in the meditation hall, but to make it an everyday life. So we have to be creative. And by being creative, we can find that meditation belongs in every moment of life, which will help us take care of difficult situation and where we can call up the energy of the warrior in us to look at the difficulty with eyes of understanding and compassion. Great. And brother, so um, one of the the key messages of Thich Nhat Hanh was that meditation, mindfulness is not about sitting on a cushion and being up in some mountain mon- monastery, but about what he coined engage Buddhism. And what he's saying essentially is that if we are going to act in the world, and it, it can be any action, can't it? It can be the way we are in our family. It can be the way we are in the community. It could be taking action about climate change or social injustice covers a whole gambit. But for us to really be effective when we reach out into the world, we have to also be able to reach into ourselves and be very, very present and have a strong foundation. So I know that, um, Fapu, in uh, the beginning of the book um, of this chapter, The Zen uh, and the Art of Saving the Planet, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, in a sense, brings that down to an essence. So I'm just wondering whether we could maybe start by just reading the first paragraph and then maybe later on we can read aspects of that chapter just to give readers a direct experience of uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's message. Of course. The image we have of an enlightened person is someone with freedom and spiritual strength who is not a victim of their environment. An enlightened person sees themselves clearly knows who they are, and has a clear understanding of reality, both their own nature and the nature of society. This understanding is the most precious gift that Zen can offer. Wow. So there's a lot to unpack there, brother. Yes. But but I mean, the, the, the heart of that for me is saying, actually, we cannot be present for anything outside of ourselves if we're not present for ourselves, that we need the stability and the strength, the fortitude and the understanding of ourselves first before we can reach out into the world. And not only do we need to understand ourselves, but we need to understand actually what's going on in society, how we relate to that. But 
tell us what what's your understanding because if it's the most precious jewel of of the sort of zen tradition maybe we should spend a bit of time on this yes let's spend a little time on this and this touches the first element the meditator or we sometimes call it the yogi and when we practice mindfulness we practice meditation we practice zen it invites us to touch a spiritual dimension in each and every one of us we may think that a spiritual dimension is going to the monastery or going to a retreat or going to a temple and yes that is one of the conditions that can help us touch that spiritual dimension inside of us but when we practice meditation we know that each and every one of us just by coming home to our breath becoming aware of our breath allowing our mind to come home to the body to touch peace to touch stability that is our spiritual dimension that we speak about here in our tradition and our teacher zen master teknik han who we call as tai has shared with us that we have to feed our spiritual dimension every day as a way to take care of our well-being in the mind and in the body i think each and every one of us we don't have to be buddhist to to talk about our spiritual dimension i don't know about you joe but from time to time even before coming to plum village if i can even remember as a kid i would have question of like what do i really want to do with my life why is the tree so beautiful what happens when i die or you know all of these questions is is touching the spiritual dimension in us i would like to share my first time um i experienced meditation my father was a refugee he left vietnam as a boat person and after he made it to canada he went on a spiritual journey for some healing because i can only imagine the difficulty and the suffering that he encountered and in 1990 tai and sister jung kong came to toronto and gave a public talk and my father um joined and he listened to the talk and after that um session he decided to go to plum village and he spent in Pl- he spent time in plum village for around four to five months and it really changed his way of life his way of looking at things and when he came home i really felt he was a new person and we used to have story time before before bed, uh, before sleeping and it was one of my sister and i's favorite part of the day because my father was a very good storyteller and he had a lot of stories um from the time in vietnam during the war as well as uh um the journey as a boat person so it was very exciting to hear all of this but every time before we sleep he would put his hand on my abdomen on my tummy and he just did that and instinctively by his hand on my tummy i felt like i had to be aware of my breath so every time i felt his hand i would feel my breathing rising and falling as i breathe in and out and i think i was already practicing meditation without knowing it so in each and every one of us we have a spiritual dimension that can be an energy to help us find clarity find balance and find peace even in the most difficult moments in our life and this is what we call the meditator to to touch enlightenment it's not a destination so far away we think that we have to practice for 50 60 years in order for us to be enlightened but enlightenment is enlightenment of something so if today we can wake up and we see 24 brand new hours as a gift that is enlightenment of seeing the day has begun having fresh eyes knowing how to live this day meaningfully that's enlightenment of the day and there are many moments in the day that we can be enlightened but to be enlightened we need time and we need stillness to see what is happening inside of us and what is happening all around us and the meditator is someone who knows how to be 
still even among the storm. But the easier time to practice is when we are happy, we are around an environment that is supportive, around a community, around friends that are supportive. So we have to find the quality in the day to nourish our our meditator inside of us. And Joe, I I think you are a meditator. You are. I, I see the way you walk, the way you look at life, the way we talk. Even our podcast is a meditation in itself. So I see that this element is so crucial in today when we're living such hectic life and our life is so fast paced. If we don't find time to pause, we don't find time to take a moment to be aware of the present moment, we will lose ourselves. So the meditator is the guide, the compass, so that we don't lose our path in life. Joe, how would you share about your experience with when you first touch your spiritual seed in you? So that's a great question. And in fact, as you were talking, that moment came straight up for me. And it, and it's not, um, it wasn't um, related to Buddhism in a sense, because I was a young kid um, and hadn't even come across Buddhism at that moment. But I remember as a eight or nine year old walking from my house, there was a little park at the top of the hill and I climbed to the top of the hill and I looked up and it was a sort of beautiful dark night and it was full of stars. And I looked up at the stars and I just thought, oh, wow, you know, here am I, this little speck on earth. Um, and yet there's this extraordinary universe. And, and it was, it was a sense of, um, of wonder, I think a sense of this extraordinary, um, expansive nature of the universe. It's it's just, there's billions of stars out there and this sense of, um, myself in relationship to that and just realizing the, the world that, that at that time I was sort of quite lonely and sad and, and quite sort of a sense of not understanding why I was alive or what I was here for. You know, I just had this complete empty space in me. And, and then looking up and realizing actually, but there's so much out there. There's so much I don't understand. And so, so it, was a, it was a sort of connection to the magnificence of life that even though I was here on my own, feeling very lonely, but that I was connected to something far greater than me. Hmm. So we've spoken about it, but our teacher has written about it. So let's read the paragraph um, that Tai talks about the meditator, and then we can share more on it. Yeah, great. In every one of us, there is a meditator, a yogi. That is the wish to meditate, to practice, to become a better person, to bring out the best of ourselves, to get enlightened, Our inner meditator brings us lucidity, calm, and deep insight. That is the Buddha nature in us. We may want to become a better person, and yet there are times we don't practice, we don't train, not because we don't want to, but because we haven't yet created the right conditions. Joe, you don't live in the monastery. Mm. How do you condition yourself so that you have this element in your daily life? So what came straight to my mind was um, my father's dying words to me and my, my mother and siblings was strike true. Mm. And, um, and he was very, very, I mean, he was obviously very, he was dying, but he, he was given this cocktail of drugs. So he wasn't really had any awareness, but, but just before he died, he sort of got this moment as, as Tyson, so it's a moment of lucidity where he came back into the present moment and he just said, looked at us and he said, strike true. And I think he said it twice, strike true. And, and for me, that was about saying that the most important thing in life is to be true to yourself. Because if we're not true to ourselves, then how can we be true to life? So I think my everyday practice, in a sense, is am I being true to myself? Am I being honest to myself? Am I uh, being open to myself? Am I prepared to challenge myself? Am I prepared to question myself? Am I prepared to uh, be open to 
um, when I'm challenged. So uh, at the moment, I'm going through a situation when someone is challenging me a lot and just saying, is this true? So not being defensive and saying, oh, they're wrong. They're this, they're that. Not to uh, make myself a victim. So not to say, oh my God, maybe I'm this, maybe I'm that, and and to fall victim to someone else's feelings, but to really interrogate life. Say, is this true? Uh, is this fair? Is there an element of this that I'm I haven't been aware of? Is this is there um, is there a blessing in this approach that actually there's something I'm being shown that's actually I wasn't aware of? Is there part of my unconscious? Is there a shadow aspect to me? So so for me, it's just. It's being able to look at life and whatever comes my way and say, is this true? And if it is true, to respond to it. And if it's not true, or if it doesn't feel true after I've really looked at it, not to fall victim to someone else's uh, beliefs. How about you, brother? How do I meditate? How do I practice? And how do I keep my meditator alive in me? Every morning, a cup of tea in mindfulness. I start off with that. Um, that has become my go-to and throughout the day, just being able to have moments of pause and to see if I am lost in the past or lost in the future or lost in my thoughts or lost in my perceptions or lost in people's perceptions about me. And when you were speaking about your difficulties and we had a conversation before we started the podcast, having a check-in moment. Um, yeah, we've been also having some conversations and sometimes it's a little bit challenging um, about, about how we handle a um, situation when somebody's going through a difficult um, difficult tease in their practice when they have their ups and downs, when they're not participating in our life as a monk, when they are, you see that they are, are, are struggling. And it's very easy for me to be judgmental and saying, you just need to tell them to straighten up, go sit on that cushion, join this community for walking meditation. But at that moment, my meditation practice is to touch into being, is to touch compassion, to see what is really going on. Like you have shared, like to investigate and see beyond the action. And, and I always start that with myself also. I ask myself, why am I being so hard on that person? Is it something that is touching something that I'm uncomfortable with in me? Because sometimes what we think is right, we project on other people or what we are going through, we also project it on the other person. So I always go back to myself first, the way out is in. I always come in to see uh, what is manifesting inside of me at that situation. And then having the time and space to be patient also. So this has been really important for me as an abbot and as a mentor. Sometimes I see someone going through um, a difficulty and I, I think I know the answer, but that answer may not be appropriate for that person yet. And sometimes having to, to create the right conditions around him or her so that he and she has the space to feel that he and she is loved. And, you know, Sometimes it's very simple. It's just, I, I have to remove my perception of what a monk should be or a nun should be. And I touch the human side of him or her. And I say, hey, let's go for a walk. Let's just enjoy the autumn leaves. Or let's, hey, want a cup of tea with me? No, 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 don't, don't, don't need to be nervous. I'm, um, you're not coming into the principal's office. <laughs> we're just going to have a cup of tea, to ask how we're doing. And, and that for me is all, also meditation. Sometimes Tai says to meditate is to have time. And so sometimes I want to have time for myself, which is very important. And having time for myself is also a way of checking in to see how my heart is, to see if I am unbalanced, if I am too stressed these days, how's my body? My body tells me if I am very stressed, if I'm overreacting because you're, you're, you have tensions build up. And then I also check where's my mind? Like, am I triggered very easily 
these days? Am I vulnerable? And if I am, am I taking care of it? Or am I solid? Am I fresh and free? If I am, how can I offer that to others? So that has been um, some meditation koans that I would ask myself in order to to uh, to see how I am being engaged. Yeah, and brother, I just want to pick up a, a couple of things you said. One is about you know we need to create space for ourselves because um, because as you said, life is very hectic and um, and we are so conditioned to be busy and that when we're not busy, we think we feel guilty about not being able to, we feel restless and feel we need to fill our time with something that, you know, that almost space has become a problem for us rather than an opportunity. And, um, and I was a while ago, I was, uh, I ran a workshop for um, some members of a global uh, NGO that works in the environment. And this was uh, post the COP26 uh, talks in Glasgow. And they, they'd come back from these two extremely busy weeks. And a couple of people said, well, you know, I'm bored, I'm restless, what do we do next? And other people were saying, you know, God, I don't even, you know, I've, I haven't even had a chance to rest, I'm on to the next thing, and I'm already on to the next thing. And, and we spent quite a lot of time just talking about the importance of taking space and that, you know, that if you're not busy, then there's a chance to enjoy being not busy to appreciate non busy not being busy to to recognize that actually most of the time we have new ideas that we're able to see things in fresh ways is when we stop and look and and I think you know there's there's an aspect to that which is also the beginner's mind isn't there brother which is um which is one of the core sort of in a sense principles of zen is that actually when we meditate there's a chance to come back to the start of the journey not to not to think oh we have to solve this at the point we are but Maybe you can tell us a bit about how the beginner's mind interrelates with this. The beginner's mind. Wow, we're becoming very Buddhist here, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's a wonderful um, um, expression. The beginner's mind, sometimes our teacher calls it the mind of love or the bodhicitta, the seed of bodhicitta. Bodhi is awakening. So the seed of awakening in all of us. We all have this quality to be alive, to be present, to have agency of how we want to live our life. And a lot of the times we get, that seed gets covered up and it is covered up by desire. It's covered up by running after a position, running after an idea of happiness, an idea of success. So we we go into this, rhythm that is nonstop and we lose ourselves. And two, we have the condition to come back to the beginner's mind, the mind of love, the seed of awakening in all of us. And that seed of awakening is a very powerful source of energy. It's, a, it's an energy that tells us that there is more to life than a car, than a house, than a position. There is something so unique about the present moment. I think you shared about that, about the stars. It's so magnificent. If we can be in nature and see the wonders of the trees, the wonders of the clouds, of how vast this earth is, you touch this, this moment of connection. And so for each and every one of us, that was just me sharing an example of a moment that that touch my seed of awakening or seed of bodhicitta. But for some of us, we may touch the seed of, of bodhicitta when we have suffered, when we've suffered so much. And one day we said, I want to transform this suffering. I know there's a way out of suffering because I have learned from others. The Buddha was a teacher who taught us that because there is suffering, there's also happiness. Because there's happiness, there's also suffering. And the two of, of these pairs are, are partners. They balance and they nourish each other. If you have tasted suffering, you know how miserable it is, how it can bring you down. You, when you see someone else suffer, that allows you to touch compassion. 
And that compassion can be an element of happiness and joy and gratitude. And when you are happy, you are fresh, you are a source of love for someone, you, you want to share that love, you want to share that happiness. And the meditator knows that both sides need food to stay alive. So if we keep nourishing our suffering, we will always suffer. So the meditator says, ah, I know suffering, you are there, and I will take time to be with you. I will see what, are, what is the root of my suffering, what is nourishing my suffering. And then if I see the root of it, then I have an answer. I have to stop doing that. And then I find a way out. That is what we call the four, the four noble truth. And it's the same with happiness. If you have happiness now, if you are someone who is fresh, someone who is love, don't take it for granted because it can also be uh, replaced by suffering if we don't know how to nourish it. So we, from time to time, the meditator, we have to take a pause. If we are living a life that has peace, love, and stability, we have to breathe in and appreciate it seeing what we are doing that gives us this quality of life, how to nourish it, how to condition it so that this element becomes stronger in us so that it can be, it can be maintained. But the meditator also knows that if one day I suffer, it's okay because suffering is a teacher. And because I have tasted happiness, I know happiness is also a seed that is there. So, so as, a, as a practitioner, we create space in our day in order to have time to reflect and to look at these questions inside of us. And brother, the, the, I mean, this isn't just a nice thing to do. This is actually the heart of being, in, in, being engaged in the world. Because, I mean, there, there's this truism that you can only help someone to the extent you've helped yourself. So if someone comes to you with a problem that you haven't addressed yourself or you haven't looked at that area of your life, you can offer sympathy, but you can't offer empathy. But when actually you have worked with that issue and you've sort of looked into it and you've found that place of deep pain in yourself and you've started to transform it, then when someone comes to you with that problem, you're present for them. And, um, and I've always felt this sense of, you know, when someone's in hell, what they need most is someone just to sit in hell with them. Mm. You don't actually sometimes have to say anything. Mm. And that's what I think, you know, Tai has taught me is about, you know, the embodiment of presence in a sense, which is I have looked at this, I can understand this territory. I don't feel fearful anymore of going to this dark place because I have made friends with it. And therefore, I can sit with you in it and just offer that to you. And that doesn't involve any words. It just involves a sense of deep connection that creates safety for the, in the world. And I, and I think that's, in a sense, in terms of being a, a sort of agent of change in the world, is to be, that's the sort of talks about our stability, doesn't it? Our ability to be present, stable, to have looked deeply and to be there for other people. Exactly. So, brother, should we go on and look at the artist? Yes, I like that. I like being creative. The artist, each and every one of us is an artist of our day, how we live our life. When we breathe in and out, that is art itself, but that is art in the body as being a human. I like to um, reflect on this because when we hear about the word artist, we think they have to. We have to be a painter. We have to be a um, a musician, an actor, a dancer to be called an artist. But actually, the Buddha once said that the mind is an artist. Whatever the mind creates, that is the world. So the way we create 
And the way we take care of our mind has a very important connection to how we relate to the world. So that, that I'm just going to drop that there, leave that there. That's a meditation in itself. How, what are you drawing each day in your daily life? But this element is more about creativity, finding the balance, finding the joy in life. As we, I think when we were young, we knew how to enjoy life really well. I think when we're hungry, we, 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 we cry, we ask mommy for food. And because we're so cute, mommy <laughs> gives us a piece of cookie or, or gives us juice. And, and when we are bored, we, we find joy and nourishment in a rock, in, in a park. There's so much creativity because our mind, we were investigating. We're always looking at life with wonders, eyes of wonders. But the more we grow up, we put on different masses we, in order to cope with situations. And a lot of the times we forget to take off that mask. And we start to get bored. We start to find a rhythm that, that we call habits. And these habits can be destructive to our well-being. Or, or if we are creative, we can find different habits to to change the, the energies in our life. So our teacher has this teaching. He says, when you are doing something and like if you're listening to a song and it's not giving you any joy, any nourishment, why continue to listen to that song? Don't you have the agency, the power to press pause or to press stop and to change the track? So in a way, the artist from time to time we are invited as a meditator to look at our daily life and see, am I happy? Am, do I have freshness in my life? Am I just sitting in the room all day? Do I have the freedom to go out for a walk, to skip down in the park, to sit on a swing? Is the swing just for a kid? So in Upper Hamlet, we have the linden tree, right? If you, when you arrive, we have this really great linden tree. And the tradition of it is it's always had a swing. And now we've added another swing. So it has two swings. And I love that tree for many reasons. But one of the reasons is I love seeing adults sit on the swing and seeing them touch the childhood inside of them. We all have a cookie of childhood. I think that's a saying, right? And so for some of us, it may be um, a cookie, a cup of milk. Uh, for some of us, it may be sitting on a swing. Or some of us from Vietnam love um, swing on the hammock. So we all have these little incibency pieces of joy in our life that we forget. So the artist is to create our life so that we don't burn out, so we don't lose energy. So we have this beginner's mind. We have this passion to offer life, our energy. But at the same time, how are we taking care of our energy so that we still have freshness? We still have moments of, of, of the day that you can smile, Joe. So, brother, I have a question for you. Because um, a lot of people who uh, don't live in the monastery, live ordinary lives, you know, they, they can... They have constant choices. They can, tonight I'm going to go to the cinema, uh, tomorrow I might go to the theatre, the next day I might go for a walk in nature, then I might go to this cafe, I might go to that restaurant. They have so many choices. So, so in a sense, you can say there, there's, so many, uh, there's so many ways to be fresh in that sense. Um, you, on the other hand, I, you, I know you travel. In normal years, you, you travel a lot. But when you're in the monastery, you've been a monk for um 17 20 20 years and you have a routine you get up in the morning you go and sit you have breakfast you then might have a class or something then go for walking meditation then have lunch you know and then might have afternoon sort of community working and then there'll be a sitting meditation in the evening it's it's very often very regular it goes on and on the same thing every day how do you stay fresh? Because some people would look at that and think it was, it's like prison. You know, you're doing the same thing every day. There's no escape from it. You can't just say, I'm off for a weekend to the Bahamas. How do you stay fresh 
in the practice? Um, when I see that the practice is not a chore, it's not a duty, and it's more of a gift of life, then I enjoy it so much more. So I, oh man, you know, sometimes Tai says like when you have insight, don't share it right away because it's still very, very um, tender. tender and you yeah. don't want to expose it yet. But here we are and it's, your question just, just brought it up. So when I come back to my beginner's mind, I remember the first day I was in Plum Village how happy I was. And what was I happy about? It was I was in a safe place. And being in Plum Village, I, I, I can't forget that, that the feeling. And to, to come back and to, to see that the life in the monastery is not a chore, it's not, it's not labor, that is how I keep my freshness. When I see that by my way of walking, my way of presence, which you just shared about, Joe, is a gift, I see that that is freshness, that is um, new, because every day we are someone new. There's a saying in Zen, you can't bathe the same river twice because the you yesterday is already different today. But a lot of time we forget that. So this insight I which I wanted to share about um, with with you and now I'm sharing with everyone. <laughs> um, I, I'm very fascinated by the life of my teacher Tai because I've had the chance to be um, around him for over 15 years as his personal attendant, and Tai was never tired of giving the Dharma of being present for the community. Joe, you remember, he was the one leading the Dhamma talk, sometime two hours, and then comes out, lead the walking meditation, and then leads the formal lunch. And then sometimes in the afternoon, he has interviews or he joins the Dhamma sharing. And I asked myself, how does my teacher have so much energy? And then there were moments when we would go on tour. We just finished a three-month tour in the U.S., which is very busy the schedule is um, um, very complex. We're flying in. Tai has to give a talk in the evening. As his attendant, I have to make sure everything is ready. And then we finish the tour and we fly back to France. And let's say today is Saturday. We arrive Saturday. Tomorrow is Sunday. A normal person would say, I just came back. I'm, I'm going to jet lag. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a day off. Tai never skips one day of mindfulness. In all of my years of being his, assist, his attendant, his assistant, there has never been one day that Tai has skipped a day of mindfulness. And now I, I, I give Dhamma talks. Um, I lead walking meditation. And there's a body of Dhamma teachers in our community, which is like his continuation body. If I give a Dhamma talk, we would ask another Dhamma teacher to lead the walking meditation um, but it's our way of sharing the responsibility to not feel like it's on one person's shoulder, which I think is also the essence of community to rely on one another. But I would ask myself, like, can I do what I do? And my first reaction is probably no, I probably can't. I would burn out. <laughs> and and I, I really was um, stuck on this question, like, how did I do it? And one day informal lunch. Because I have to confess, out of all of the practice in Plum Village, formal lunch was one of the practices that I dread the most. So for those who are listening who don't know what formal lunch is, it's a very long session of eating. <laughs> <laughs> so the bell is invited, we all gather, but we don't, we don't get our lunch yet. We, we wait for the, mon the monks and nuns to gather. And then there's three sound of the bell, and it's the only day that we eat in our order of ordination. So the nuns would line up on one side, the monks would line up on one side in order of ordination, and then we all serve our food. And then we would enter into the meditation hall, and the rule is we wait until everyone arrives. Now in the pandemic, we have less people, so our formal lunch is faster, but 
in retreat modes, even in the summer when we when we've had hundreds of people, sometimes we would sit there for 45 minutes waiting for everyone to arrive. But the rule is you wait for everyone to arrive. And then the sound of the bell and then the contemplations before eating and then the five contemplations in three different languages. And then you start to eat in 20 minutes of silent. And with your cold food by then. By then our food is cold. <laughs> and after the meal is finished, depending on the bell master, he or she would invite the CTC, the caretaking council to announce what is the activity of the afternoon. And then we would read out requests from people to send energy to a loved one who is going through a difficulty, either physically or mentally, or someone who has passed away to offer a blessing and the community would chant. And so, and, and then we would end our session. And then we don't even leave yet because we then leave in a possession in an ordination order. So the whole session can be one hour and a half or sometimes one, an hour, 45 minutes sometimes. So that's just lunch. And, and I, I know that this is one of my most difficult practice to find joy and to find ease in. And one day I was sitting at the bell. Now that I am the abbot and, and I help lead these sessions. And I said, how did I do it? And I found the answer or my answer is that in those moments of waiting, Thai is resting. In those moments of waiting, Thai enjoys just sitting, doing nothing with the Sangha. And I just started to see, wow, when Thai walks and he leads walking meditation, he is just walking. He is enjoying every step. He doesn't probably even have to put on the label that I am leading the walking. Tai is just walking. And Tai have shared with us many times that when he practiced walking, he is very relaxed. And that's how he's caring for his body. That is how he is taking care of his meditator seed and his creativity. And then when Tai um, drinks tea with his students, he doesn't see, oh man, as a teacher, I, I have to spend time with my student. Oh man, they have more problems. I thought I gave them all the tools already. He doesn't go through this, probably this, these kind of thoughts that I go through. Like, oh man, when somebody knocks on my door and they want to see the abbot, I'm like, is it a problem that I have to solve? And I started having sessions with brothers, with lay friends, with you, Joe. <laughs> 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 what, it's, not, it's not like, oh man, what does Joe want today? It's like, hi Joe, you want a cup of tea? And then the whole environment changes. The whole spirit of that practice changes. So I would say, I, everyday practicing, I understand my footsteps more. I understand my breath more. I understand sitting and doing nothing more. And that becomes very new for me. Wow. So, brother, um, I have to admit that um, formal lunch is my most difficult moment <laughs> <laughs> in the monastery. Props, so, props to that. Props to that. We are the so, same. <laughs> so I am the youngest of six kids, so I have food anxiety issues. So firstly, it's sort of, is is there going to be enough food for me? Because in formal lunch, all the monastics go first and then, uh, and then the lay practitioners after. So is there any food left? So that's my first problem. And then the second one is that when I'm sitting there and my food is there, I want to eat it. And, and I, you know, and the meditation halls all have big windows so you can see when people are coming. And as you say, I'm, I, I'm always thinking, because you're at the bell, you're in charge. And I'm thinking, Fapu, it doesn't matter if not everyone's there. Look, they're just, they're people are just sitting out there in the sunshine and they'll get their food and we're all sitting here. And it's not fair. It's not fair that people are outside taking their time while everyone is sitting here in silence. And, um, and I am now starting to try and work on that. Because I've thought, right, well, I'll just close my eyes and I'll ignore it. But actually, that's not working because at, at the base of it is the issue that I feel almost, um, I don't know, it's actually a really good question. What, what is the feeling? It's, it's a feeling of, of lack of fairness, actually, that people are not showing fairness and respect by turning up, that they're, they're 
taking longer than they need to and that I'm being forced to wait. So actually it's a really interesting because actually every practice shows us what is there to be healed, what, there, what is it we haven't solved, what is it we are comfortable with, what is it we're uncomfortable with. It doesn't matter what it is. And, um, and just to come back to the core of what I hear you saying, brother, is that you know, the, the Buddha's great insight was with our thoughts we, cre- we create the world. And so actually every single thought we have has a power. And every single thought we have, we have a choice of to have that thought, or even if we don't have a choice, even if that thought comes out, we have a choice of what to do with it. So actually every moment of our life is the life of an artist because every moment of our life we make choices about, do I do this or not do that? Should I Do I look at this with the eyes of compassion or do I let my anger take over from me. So actually, we're constantly creating the world in ourselves. And then, as you say, we we project it out onto the world. So what we see in the world, in that sense, I used to struggle for years, brother, with the idea, with our thoughts, we create the world. How how can that be true? Mm. But it is that when we see life differently, then the world does change it. Because actually, the world isn't one thing. The world is just what we choose to make it. So um, so I found actually that's the deepest form mm. of artistry mm. is saying, actually, I could, when we become more conscious, in a moment, I could be very angry with this person. And it touches into my habit. I've got justification, but actually I'm not going to. And those become the moments where we sort of can tr- sort of transform. And, and, and there's one, um, just to answer one of your question is... Um, you ask like we have such a routine life mm. and so you know we, yes it is routine because it also helps us with developing our discipline in a way discipline of body and mind and how we if we are allowing ourselves to just be carried away by our habits but we also have a lot of fun in the monastery so from time to time it does get like routine and uh, we we all get bored a little bit so from time to time we would change the day so we would have um, picnic days when I would say, okay, brothers, sisters, let's, let's go for a picnic. No, no business talk. No, uh, we're not going to sit there and, and look at the lake in stillness for 25 um, minutes or, or an hour. We can sit there for a few minutes in silence, but then bring out the guitar, bring out the drums, let's sing a few songs, um, let's play a few games, let's go on these hikes around our monasteries, we, we live in such a beautiful area. So um, just to also share that in the monastery, especially in Plum Village, um, you you see monastics, we play soccer, we play football, we play basketball, we play volleyball, we even practice Tai Chi with paths, um, we do yoga, we even do, um, some of us, we, we've got into, into, exercising a lot like physically like even with weights and 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 sometimes we would do this it's really fun this cardio day there'd be like eight of us in the zendo and we all do a cardio track together and and we're all sweating so like just to let everyone know that also we are humans and we are young and we we need to care for our body so we do try to be creative to make sure that we are balanced also cuz yes it is true in our life we do do a lot of sitting whether it is sitting meditation as a practice or a dhamma talk which is we are sitting classes we are sitting meetings we are sitting this podcast we are sitting so we do have to find the right balance so the creativity comes in to make sure that we don't get stuck or we feel stuck and and just lastly brother i mean the most important thing about creativity is is it's is it's juicy Mm -hmm. and you know and and i i sometimes think you know when when people you know going back to this idea of engagement in the world whether you're an activist or whatever however you engage in the world that if you turn up juicy and joyous and that you're creative it's an infectious energy and and i have a a good friend called solitaire townsend who runs a a big uh, sustainability consultancy called futera and and she's always said look if we want to get people to change the world you've got to do it in a joyous way if you look as though you're sucking lemons 
you know, why would anyone want to want to change? But actually, if we if we're vibrant, energetic, we're showing that the future actually could be much more beautiful, much more dynamic, much more engaging. Then actually, that's attractive. And if we keep on, you know, you know, having doing the same thing repeatedly, then actually, that person will become bored, and so will other people. Yes, so let us hear what our teacher has to say oh, in yes. this chapter. Much more intelligent than the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> in each one of us, there is an artist. The artist is very important. The artist can bring freshness, joy, and meaning to life. You need to allow the artist in you to be creative, so you can always feel and enjoy the nourishment in your practice of mindfulness. Many of us can stand monotony. If we have too much of something, we want to change it. Even if we know it's good, this is only natural. You may ask, how can we keep going on a path we want to go on and keep going to the end? Of course, you need patient, but you also need something else. The path should be joyful, nourishing, and healing. So we have to find a way to create the joy every day. We have to organize our daily life so it's not repetitive, and so each moment can be a new moment. We must find creative ways to keep our bodhicitta, our beginner's mind, alive and nourished. Whether you're eating in mindfulness, driving in mindfulness, or practicing walking meditation or sitting meditation, you have to invent new ways of doing it so that the breathing, walking, and sitting always brings you delight. Solidity and peace. On the outside, it may look the same, but you're walking as a new person. You're sitting very differently. You are evolving. I can tell you, I never get bored of walking in mindfulness. When I walk, every step is a delight, and not because I am delight or disciplined, but because I allow the artist in me to operate, and to make my practice new, interesting. Nourishing and healing. Practicing mindfulness can always be healing and nourishing. If we know how to be creative, we shouldn't practice like a machine, but as a living being. According to Master Lynchy, if while walking or eating or going about your day, you can create even just one flash of mindfulness, that's good enough. Just one percent success is good enough because that one percent can be the ground of many other percents. And I I love that brother because because it takes away all the need for success in it. That that you know this idea that if you're that uh, if you're not uh, able to be fully present for most of the day that you're failing. Is is he's saying that even if you get this one moment. That is good enough, and you should you should relish it and enjoy it, and and that's part of the artistry, isn't it? That you don't that you see it uh, um, almost um, a spark, and you say that's good enough because that spark is likely to kindle a fire at some point. So, brother, now on to the warrior. Now, I love this bit because it's... Uh, I don't know if it's because I'm a bloke. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's a gender thing, but the idea of taking out the sword of truth and cutting through um, cutting through the misunderstandings of the world and, and taking action. Um, actually, there's something just about that energy in me that immediately I feel it coming up. So it's great to sit and it's and be mindful, and it's great to uh, be an artist. But this idea of just sort of rising up, it, it has it, it it brings a lot of energy for me. But what about you, brother? What, what's your take on it? The warrior. Yeah. I see it. I see the mountain in the warrior. The mountain that is a refuge for many people, a refuge for all beings, birds, animals, trees, and the mountain can. 
hold his ground even in the greatest storm, and that is to represent the challenges in our in our life. There's gonna be moments when we meet a very difficult situation, and it's gonna question our action, our thoughts, our speech, and those moments are when we have to invoke the warrior of great understanding inside of us to take care of that present moment in a skillful way. I have done many, um, many, many things that I can call shortcomings by by emotions, by anger, and at those moments, I don't. I, I can say that I have allowed the habits to take over. So the warrior is also the eye that can see the habit of what is manifesting inside. But the warrior is also the energy of aspiration, of determination. Like the bodhicitta that we have touched on, the beginner's mind of wanting to change, wanting to to put into action our aspiration. Because an idea is great, an aspiration is still a view in a way. And we need the warrior to put it into our daily life. We, as a meditator who has now a vision, we see that by doing that, create suffering. Do you have the strength to stop doing that? That is the warrior. Do you allow your aspiration to come into fruit, for it to bear fruit? Or do you still just like the idea of it? Right, and also the warrior for me is also someone who has the capacity to hold his um, his belief, his truth, and this comes to my teacher. Um, I know, and you know, our teacher went through the war, and during during the Vietnam War, there was a lot of challenges because. If you are surrounded by violence and discrimination and injustice, you ask yourself, what can I do? And at that time, when you see that both sides are fighting, it's easy to pick a side. But our teacher was enlightened enough and was awakened to say that violence is not the way. Nonviolence is the way. And compassion is also an a we can say a weapon of the warrior, the compassion. There is fierce compassion. There are moments when we have to say, no, you cannot do that because that creates more harm, that creates more un- misunderstanding. And sometimes we have to invoke the gentle compassion, the mother seed in us to care and to love. And I saw by the history of my teacher, by his his, his stories, like when he would go out and... Um, and help villages that are destroyed. And as that warrior, he's not fighting, but he's help rebuilding. And I think for me, re- re-imaging and recreating the image of the warrior is to bring back life rather than to destroy life. I think a lot of us, when we think of a, a warrior, even for me, is like someone with armor, with a sword, with a spear, with a bow and arrow. I think we can recreate this warrior this this image of this warrior is to protect, to care, to nourish, to help bring life into the world. And I think this was part of the aspiration of our teacher of engaged Buddhism during that particular time because there was so much life that was taken away. So our teacher was going around with his community of social worker, young monks, young nuns, um, lay men and lay women who didn't want to uh, pick up arms, but they wanted to be another force, a force of love and a force of compassion. And for me, that's a warrior also. Wow. So what was coming up in my mind was um, when I was young, I used to be another, I used to be the warrior rather than, rather than the warrior. So I used to have lots of worries. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of worries. So, so I was a warrior. <laughs> and and um, and in a sense, my feelings of sort of uh, my lack of purpose, my sense of meaninglessness in the world, you know, 
I, I was a victim of the world. So um, because I was unable to truly feel myself or understand my worth, I everything, all my worth and value came from my experiences, the mirror of how other people responded to me. So, um, so in that place, I had no power. I was, I was feeling a lot of powerlessness because actually the only way I could feel my place in the world was through other people's response to me. And because I was craving a positive response, I basically gave up all my power to the world around me. And in a sense, I emptied out all my own power. And so, so for me, the warrior is, the true warrior is about being able to stand firm and in my truth. So it relates to what I was saying earlier about Strike True, which is saying that actually I need to look deeply about what is true and what action I can take in that moment. And that is about regardless of what people think of me. And I find that, Brother Fabu, the most difficult thing because I have this very strong habitual pattern to be liked. Mm. And so uh, normally the way I respond to things is in a very soft way, which is not, which is not the same as, it's the opposite of fierce compassion. It's actually, actually based on fear, which is that if I challenge that person, then they won't like me. And so, so it's a very, very old pattern in me. And the transformation of that is to say, actually, this is what I believe. This is what I'm going to, how I'm going to act. Regardless, it's not that I'm going to aim to upset people. It's not that I want to aim to hurt people, but that I cannot determine other people's response. And that all I can do is be as close to the truth for me as, as I can be. And then trust life. And, and I think that um, if we're all hiding away from that warrior energy, actually that creates a life where things get destroyed, where things are devalued, where people uh, abuse each other when there's inequality. And uh, because power gets skewed, because either people feel powerless or actually they, they need their power and they, they feel very powerful, but actually there's a lot of need behind that. So, so for me, a warrior is a person who's in their true power, who's able to stand firm, as you say, a bit, it's a very similar image to a mountain, but that ability to stand firm on the ground and, and whatever comes towards you that you can, or I can, or we can, hold that place. Beautiful. And I, I've i met many warriors in my life that has supported me. And I I also realize when that I have to be a warrior also for myself. So so there are moments when we I I fall into into this idea that I should be a warrior, a mountain for other people. And I get lost in that. And there was a moment in my in my monastic path, I was very lost and confused. And I was so Wow, just remembering of that that those days, I was so dreadful. <laughs> I every day waking up was 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 uh, was misery, <laughs> and and it was because I wasn't ready to face the loneliness and the doubt that was inside of me. And during that time, it was my brothers and my sisters that in in the community that they became the loving warriors that came to me and, and said, brother, can we have a cup of tea with you? Can we support you in any way? Can we just listen? And they were the ones who helped me share. And by sharing, I was able to reflect myself to see what is it that I am afraid of? What is it that is making me so miserable. And now that I can can talk about it more comfortably, I I was I can say that it was thanks to their stability that I was able to see myself with my own two eyes with not hiding under under anything. Whether it is fear or whether it is um, a perception that 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 has been 
curated and I've been carrying and by what other people perceive of me or what I perceive of myself. And by looking at my fear and my doubt, I was able again to touch the question, but is this fear and doubt really worth to bring me down every single day? And then I start to see I am more than this. There are the seed of aspiration in me, the seed of mountain, the seed of of wanting to offer, the seed of wanting to be a better person. And so sometimes the warrior is also just to help the other touch those seed in them. And and in that sense, you know, you talked about the warrior, the image of someone wearing armor. For me, the warrior is actually someone who's taken off their armor and and allows their heart to be seen and to allow their vulnerability. Because I, I think the ultimate strength is to show up wounds and all and to show your vulnerability because that gives everyone permission to show up as they are. And and that that takes enormous um, courage to actually say, I'm this is who I am, warts and all, with all my problems, this is who I am, because that allows everyone to do that. And and brothers, it's what's so interesting as, as we're talking is is of course, and of course it would be like this, but the interrelationship between those three. Mm-hmm. Because if for someone who's able to take time to come back to yourself and then have creativity uh, is the ground on which you can then be a warrior. And if you're a warrior, that is also feeds into the creativity and, and into the mindfulness because you, you act with, with mindfulness. So, so actually those three are all actually completely interrelated. But should we see what Ty has to say? Because uh, the problem with all these brothers is that every time we just warble on and then we listen to Ty and say, oh, God, that sounds much better. Yes. But anyway, let's give Ty his time. In every one of us, there is a warrior. The warrior brings a determination to go ahead. You refuse to give up. You want to win. And as a practitioner, you have to allow this fighter in you to be active. You don't become a victim of anything. You fight in order to renew your meditation practice. You fight in order to allow things to become boring. And so the meditator goes together with the warrior. We should not be afraid of obstacles on our path. In fact, there are many things that can discourage you. But if your energy of bodhicitta is strong, if your warrior is strong, you can overcome these obstacles. And every time you overcome them, your bodhicitta will get stronger. In this way, obstacles are not really obstacles. They are an accelerator of wisdom, of aspiration. The meditator, the artist, and the warrior are not three separate people. They are three aspects of your person, and you should allow all three aspects to be active at the same time in order to have balance. We have to mobilize them all and never let one of them die or become too weak. If you are an activist, a political leader, or a leader in your community, you have to know how to cultivate these three aspects within yourself so you can offer balance steadiness, strength, and freshness for those around you. Um, Brother Fapu, before we finish, is, are there, is there any other stories you have about Ty in regard to his warrior spirit? Because he went through all sorts of uh, challenges through his life. Mm. And I'm just wondering if there's if there's anything that comes to mind about when Ty sort of, in a sense, brought those three together and was able to be sort of um, fully present in that sense. Mm. 
there's a moment that that comes up right now for me. Um, there was a moment when we started our centers in Vietnam, and we built these monasteries. And within two years, our community grew so fast. We had 400 monastics. That's wow. Even when I think about that, I get goosebumps. Like, how did that happen? Wow, what a, what an era! But then suddenly, our presence in in Vietnam as a monastery, as an organization, uh, sparked some fear in in the country, in the government. So we had to disband. And that moment of being disbanded was a really tough time in the Sangha. This was 2008. And I remember our community mobilizing together to find ways of understanding the situation, recognizing that it's a very difficult moment. Our brothers, our sisters, who I've have not met yet because they are in Vietnam, but they are part of my family. And hearing that they cannot live peacefully was, it hurt to think of that. And, and, and that's me as a brother and Thai as a teacher who all of these monks and nuns took refuge under and who's, who became his student, his disciple. I, I'm sure as a teacher, Tai had to activate the meditator to see clearly what is happening and then not to be a victim of that moment, to have clarity. And in those moments, I remembered Tai would activate his practice of walking meditation. We would do a lot of walks with Tai. Um, some days uh, after sitting meditation in the morning and then breakfast, and Tai would go for hours of walking and just to make sure that he is not overwhelmed by maybe, f this is me thinking out loud, huh? um, by maybe despair or feeling of what can I do as a teacher, but to have, to embrace that energy, to embrace those emotions that are manifesting. Because if I am having those feelings, I'm sure my teacher is having those feelings. And then Tai would be an artist in finding a way to not drown in the difficulty. So in the days of mindfulness that we had together, Tai would share to the Sangha how we can practice together to support all of our brothers and sisters who are going through a difficult time. And we would chant more during that, that time because collective chanting is a very powerful energy. And we would sometimes, we say, we send our energy of peace and love to places of difficulty. So the artist, the warrior came together. So we channeled our collective energy to a place by singing, by chanting, by practicing together. And Tai would also need nourishment. So I, I remember he would spend more time with the community. He loved, one of Tai's joy was to see the brothers and sisters and lay friends play together. Either it's soccer, it's um, football, it's volleyball or a bonfire or even working together. Uh, I remember when we were building the meditation hall, um, Tai would like to just come and watch the community work together. So he would find nourishments here and there just to be balanced. And then the warrior, the clarity came out. And Tai said, we have to make sure that the safety of our brothers and sisters is they are protected, is a priority. So we would mobilize, we would, we would reach out to different um, places to find a new refuge. And which later now is the Plum Village Thailand International Sangha Community Practice Center in in Pak Chong in Thailand. Now our most of most of our brothers and sisters um, moved there and many of them have came over to Plum Village, have come over to the US centers, have come over to the practice center in Australia, in Hong Kong, in Germany. So in that moment, not giving up and not being caught also by, no, but we need a center in Vietnam, but which it is still a very deep aspiration is to have a center in Vietnam, which is like our root tradition, where it's from, but not to be caught in that view. And Thay said, if it can't be manifested now because of condition, let us 
find and create different conditions and which is now all of these centers with all of these brothers and sisters that are here now. So that was a, a, a very precious moment that I, I was able to, to be beside Tai and to see his human side. Yeah. Thank you, brother. So, um, dear listeners, we hope you've enjoyed this episode and, and also, you know, just that, you know, and it's for all of us that when we go out into the world and we want to create change or even to be there for other people, first of all, let us always remember to bring our meditator, our artist and our warrior along with us because those are will give us the confidence, uh, the ability and the courage to act. If you would like to listen to other episodes from the series The Way Out Is In, then you can find us on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, on other platforms that carry podcast series, and also on our very own Plum Village app. And this podcast was brought to you by the generous donors of the Thich Nhat Hanh Foundation. If you would like to support future episodes of the podcast and the work of the International Plum Village community, please visit www.tnhf.org slash donate. Thank you, brother. Um, so I we started out this podcast with me being a bit worried because I thought, what are we going to talk about? But as usual, as soon as we start, the whole universe opens up for us. So thank you, brother. And um, as is the custom now, not the habit, but the custom, and to bring your creativity in, brother, your artistry, um, into um, our guided meditation that you do for us every week. So take us away, brother, or bring us home. Hello, listener. I would invite you all to have a moment of stillness if we are sitting on the bus, sitting on a car, on a plane, on a train, going for a walk, going for a jog, or at home, if we can allow ourselves to just be still for a few moments of mindful breathing and allow me to guide you to touch the meditator in you, the artist and the warrior. Breathing in, I bring my awareness to my breath. How wonderful it is to breathe in. And breathing out, I bring my awareness to my out breath. How wonderful it is to breathe out. Aware of in breath, aware of out breath. As I breathe in, I allow myself to fully dwell in my in-breath from the beginning to the end. And as I breathe out, I allow myself to fully enjoy the out-breath from the beginning to the end. Full in-breath and full out-breath. Breathing in, I am in touch with the seed of love inside of me, my beginner's mind, the mind of wanting to be kinder, more beautiful. That love is a source of energy of compassion in me. Breathing out, I allow myself to nourish that seed inside of me. Bodhicitta, seed of love, energy of compassion. Breathing in, I touch freshness inside of me. Freshness in life, freshness in this breath. This is a new moment. Breathing out. I allow this moment to manifest as it is. The wonders of life are all around me and I am a wonder of life. 
a flower in the garden of humanity. Freshness, flower. Breathing in, I see the mountain inside of me, the clarity, the stability in this very moment. Breathing out, I allow this mountain to be present, not carried away by the past or carried away by a perception, an idea, a thought. Breathing out, I enjoy the stability. Mountain solid. Breathing in, I touch space inside of me, openness always wanting to grow, to have more understanding, to have more love. With this openness, I touch freedom. Breathing out, freedom in the here and now. Breathing in space, breathing out freedom. Breathing in, I am the meditator, the artist, and the warrior. Breathing out, I allow these three elements to be alive in this very moment and the next moment. In elements of the meditator, the artist, and the warrior, breathing out. This element nourish and care for my well-being. Breathing in, I enjoy this breath. How wonderful. Breathing out, I am in touch with life inside of me and life all around me. Thank you, listeners. We wish you a wonderful day and see you again next time on our podcast.